Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program, now in our 25th year of broadcast. And you know what? We've got lots of amazing listeners. You're going to hear from some of them today, not actually, but through email because it's Ask the Guys, your questions, our answers today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Hey everyone, it's Brad Sumrock. Happy New Year, and I'm so excited that for the first time ever, we are doing an Invest in Apartment Challenge. And this is a free five-day event, and I wanna help you invest in apartments in 2021. By participating in this five-day challenge, you're gonna get to leverage my 19 years of apartment investor experience. And this is for anybody that wants to be a successful apartment investor. And if you're not already investing in apartments, then 2021 needs to be your year. So I'm excited to help you get into the apartment investing business in 2021. See you in the challenge. Join Brad Sumrock and his special guest for the 2021 Invest in Apartments Challenge. Send an email to apartmentchallenge at realestateguysradio.com to learn more and get registered. It's free. That's Apartment Challenge at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys Radio Show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, it's our co-host and financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, after a quarter of a century of doing this program, one of the things we've come to appreciate the most is our amazing listeners from all over the world, frankly. And uh, every couple of months, we reach into the mailbag, if you will, and uh, do our Ask the Guys show. And today, we've got just a ton of great questions. And here's how it works. Uh, we don't answer every question. Uh, we, we couldn't actually do that. But what we do is we try to figure out questions that we think will have broad appeal. Lots of people can learn from the answers. And the only caveats are we are not tax or legal professionals. We don't give advice. We give ideas and information. So with that, let's head to question number one. This comes from Preston in Boston, Massachusetts. Gentlemen, my wife and I are longtime listeners and absolutely love your show. Keep it up. All right, so just a quick hint in getting your question on the air. You know, a nice compliment is a good way to start. Uh, we're in our early 30s and have been building our buy and hold portfolio for over 10 years. We built a well-rounded portfolio of single family and several multifamily residential properties for a total of 16 doors. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. All of our doors thus far have been high demand B-class properties with strong cash flow within linear or cash flow markets. However, they are unlikely to appreciate based on the markets we're in and the product type that we've bought. So here's my question. Should we add into our portfolio mix several properties that have strong potential for appreciation, which require much larger down payments? For example, maybe purchasing in markets like Dallas, Denver, or Nashville that have high demand for rentals and strong economic drivers, but require more capital to get into deals. My wife and I have observed many individuals being able to 1031 out of high cost areas like San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle, and can even retire themselves on one appreciation deal as they 1031 into the cash flow markets. Thus, our intention with the purchase in the previously mentioned markets would be to one day 1031 back into strong cash flow properties. As always, if we decide to pursue this appreciation play, it will need to pencil and pass the cash flow from day one standard that we subscribe to. Thanks again. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. All the best, Preston. Well, Preston, that was a very thorough question. And the reason I wanted to start with it is it brings up just kind of a fundamental philosophy that every investor has to decide. And that is, am I more geared towards appreciation or cash flow? When we talk about personal investment philosophy, that's one of the metrics we use. And it's not right or wrong. And there's actually more to the answer than you might think. Well, I think one thing to really be aware of is the difference between what I call faux equity and real equity. Income property is valued by the income it produces. The more income, the more value. When you have properties that are going up and the income is not going up, that's faux equity. And that can happen. It can happen because cap rates are going down, interest rates are going down, and people are willing to bid more for the same yield. I think we're probably near the end of that life cycle because interest rates are about as low as they could possibly go. I'm not saying they wouldn't go lower, but there's not a lot of room left underneath. So that's one consideration. But whether it's cash flow or appreciation based on people bidding up, at the end of the day, it's about supply and demand. And so the fundamental driver you have to look at is supply and demand. And you mentioned some specific markets, San Francisco, LA, and Seattle. I'm going to hone in on San Francisco and Seattle. Those two marketplaces have largely been recipients of all the dollars being pumped into tech. 
When money gets pumped into tech, it shows up in the form of salaries, stock options, and a lot of prosperity for those companies in the marketplaces they're located in. Governments can be like that. Washington, D.C., or many state capitals can be that way because they have a source of really unlimited money coming in, and that works its way through the marketplace. So whatever market you decide to go in from an appreciation perspective, if you're not forcing that equity through something you have direct control over and you're counting on the market to do it, really dig deep into understanding where the money in that particular market comes from, and then ask yourself, is whatever's been driving equity in the past likely to continue to drive it in the future? Well, and your point about knowing people who have been able to do a single 1031 and kind of coast after that, we're in the same boat. We both hail from a very highly appreciating area, Silicon Valley originally, and uh, know lots of folks that sold their residence after living in it for 10 years or more and had seven figures. So here's the the age-old dilemma. When you're starting out as a real estate investor, and granted, you guys aren't starting out, but there's lots of folks listening, you pick a market like the markets you guys are in that provide cash flow at not a lot of down payment. So you don't need that much money to get in. But to your point, Preston, as you're now figuring out, there's not also a lot of appreciation upside. So your primary benefit's going to come from cash flow in and whatever tax benefits you might be able to use. You're not gonna get those big bumps. So should you add uh, into the mix appreciating properties? This is totally about your personal investment philosophy because Dallas at one point was a cash flow market that you could have got in relatively inexpensively with low down payments. And we helped folks do that for years and years and years. Today, it's still a very strong market, but the pricing is such, and what Russ was talking about, the cap rates are lower, they've been compressed, so the returns don't look anywhere near as high as they once did. What you trade for higher cash flow is a market that is stable and proven, and that appreciation play. You know, most of our investment career, we wouldn't have considered Dallas-Fort Worth to be an appreciating marketplace. And of course, there's multiple markets within that. Uh, but today, it kind of is. Same with Nashville. I remember when Nashville was one of the most affordable markets that had robust rentals because of the diversity of income and tenant base. And today, that diversity is still there, but it's been priced out of the reach of the starting investor. So I wouldn't dissuade you from picking an appreciating market. And I do think with a little bit of homework and due diligence and trusty market analysis, you'll be able to find some markets that are not yet San Francisco and Seattle, but are going to be poised for appreciation, even while they will cash flow to start. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing is you just have to recognize where we're at in the world and in the cycle and it's a brand new world. We certainly still haven't felt the full ramifications of the COVID-19 lockdown from 2020. Uh, some of that is going to carry forward. The Fed is obviously uh, ready to print money. The government's ready to print money. And based on the new administration coming in, it looks like there's going to be a whole heck of a lot more printing happening. Generally, that bodes well for real estate, but it takes time for that stimulus, if you will, to work its way through and get down to where it affects people and wages and their ability to make bigger payments and bid up either for rent or for single family homes, depending on the product niche that you're in. The other thing is that COVID-19 has changed as we've talked about in our series uh, when it first broke and we continue to revisit as we've gone through this together, uh, the way businesses operate, the way people operate. It's a lot more emphasis on residential. Obviously, uh, you're a residential investor, and so you're probably in one of the better, or perhaps best niches you could be in. Best, cheapest money, uh, longest term, and obviously the, the most secure demand. But you also have to look at what's going on around you, and it's harder today. You can't necessarily judge how robust a jobs market is by the office market anymore. That used to be the easy metric. You know, you could look at the office market and go, wow, there's a lot of jobs. Today, not so much. So, you, you know, your, your due diligence uh, needs to be a little bit more thorough. And when you can find properties or neighborhoods that you think are turning, you know, Victor Menashe, a friend of ours, talks a lot about buying on the line, looking where the path of progress is and buying just on the other side of the line where it's not so good. Good, but as the line moves or you're able to move the line, uh, you end up creating uh, a little bit of equity that way. So 
There's going to be what the market will give you, what we call passive equity. And then there's going to be what you're able to create through better management, whatever improvements you may make, or selectively picking marketplaces where there's a group of investors all working together to bring it up. And that's another way to kind of take a little bit more control over the equity uh, experience. So great question, Preston. Hopefully you and your wife can talk through what that looks like for you. I think maybe adding some quote unquote appreciating properties might make sense, but do stay true to uh, the investor chops that you've built up. For those of you that are newer in your investment career, just understand just because you can buy a property inexpensively for not a lot of money down and it'll cash flow $100 a month doesn't make it a great investment. The reality is at $100 or $200 positive cash flow, for most people to get to their dream number, it just takes a lot of property. There's other ways to do that and appreciation is sure one of them. Hey, our next question is from Eric from Anchorage, Alaska. Hi guys, first off, I jumped in with both feet and attended the 2019 Summit at Sea. It was the best real estate decision I have ever made. Learned a ton from the big brains. I learned even more from the tribe, compressing timeframes by 10. Can't wait to see everyone in Belize. All right, well, our 19th Annual Investor Summit is not a summit at sea. It's a summit on the sand. The cruise ships aren't quite in a, a place where they can guarantee that we'll be able to get on. So we're going to beautiful Belize. You can find out the details. If you go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click the button that says Summit, uh, Eric goes on, long story short, I purchased five places since the summit and now have nine single family homes in three states, not including my airplane rental hangars in Oregon. All are rented with mortgages. Only one in Alabama isn't current on the rent. They're cash flowing a couple hundred bucks a month each, <laughs> as we just talked about, and I'm hoarding it for the next purchase. Good job. I still need to work my nine to five to cover my life expenses. I'm 54 and I would like to retire from my nine to five no later than age 62 with a minimum $10,000 monthly income. Did I ramp up my game too late? What am I missing? Thank you for listening to me second guessing myself. See you at the syndication event in March. All right, Eric, great to see you at Goals, by the way. And uh, thanks for the question. Uh, love the fact that what whatever age, here's a guy who got into the tribe and took a bunch of action. And good job building up your portfolio. Having an in-game target like the $10,000 minimum passive monthly income is a great place to start. So again, back into personal investment philosophy, you have to kind of begin with the end in mind. What are you trying to accomplish? And I think having a target is an excellent start. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we wrote about this back in Equity Happens and we used $10,000 a month passive income as kind of the target and showed people how they could breed equity where you buy a property and hopefully have a forced equity opportunity. You fix it up, cash out refinance, take the proceeds and make it a down payment on a second property and buy a stream of income. And then both properties appreciate because of market considerations, hopefully uh, inflation considerations. And then you refinance those and two become four and four become eight and eight become 16. And of course, if you've ever looked at that type of exponential growth, what ends up happening at the tail end, it really starts to take off. So uh, when you say, am I too late? Probably not. But I think where you're really on track, if you've got the chops and, you know, syndication isn't for everybody, but syndication is absolutely positively without question, the fastest, surest way to grow equity quickly on your own portfolio without having to take a bunch of uh, triples and home run swings because you are able to leverage other people's money. And the thing about people that have already accumulated quite a bit on their balance sheet, they tend to be fairly conservative and they're more interested in preservation of capital and beating inflation and getting a reasonable amount of growth. Well, those deals are easier to put together. And when you're getting a piece of the action for being the person putting it all together, that's a way to increase your personal income and your personal net worth. And the other thing that I love about it is that it takes working a day job and investing on the side and compresses them into one full-time activity. When you become a full-time syndicator, now you get your personal time back. You might work your 50, 60 hours a week. I mean, you work. It's a, it, it, it's a lot of work. You're running a business. The buck stops on your desk. It's a lot of responsibility. Maybe you don't want to work that hard. If you organize it properly, eventually you won't have to. But in the beginning, any startup takes a lot of effort. 
But the thing is, if you're working a day job and trying to invest on the side in your own account, you're playing small and you're taking a lot more time to do it. And you're probably taking a lot more personal risk and exposure because you don't have a big enough portfolio to diversify markets, product types, niches, and all that. And you don't have enough budget to hire a lot of help. So you're doing a lot of busy work that you wouldn't have to do if you were a syndicator. So we're obviously raving fans about syndication. We're not saying it's for everybody, but when you come to the syndication event in March, as you said you are, uh, you're going to get a chance to meet a lot of people that are doing it. Two days of finding out what it's all about and the basic fundamentals of what you need to know and who you need to be to pull it off. And we've had a lot of people take that class and come out of it and build successful syndication businesses. Yeah. And as we were just alluding to, it's just the the age old, you know, uh, holy grail of real estate investing is a single family house that cash flows. But if you do the math, they're going to cash flow a couple hundred dollars a month. So if my number is 10,000, you just got to, I mean, that's a lot of houses, right? So there are faster ways to compress time frames. You could certainly get into bigger deals. You could invest passively, but being a syndicator and getting into the syndication game is truly a tremendous shortcut, especially for a guy that's got nine properties in three different states and commercial property. You've already built an impressive real estate resume. That's what people are looking for in syndication. Now, you do have to get educated on handling other people's money, and you've got to understand the legalities and paperwork. And that just is training, and it takes time, but it's totally doable. And I think you're on a great track, Eric. It's Ask the Guys. Your questions are answers. More when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Hell. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Real Estate Guys listeners, are you tired of losing real estate deals due to financing issues? Have you had enough of waiting on banks, lenders, and investor groups to fund new projects? What if there were a way to eliminate all the hassle and invest in real estate on your own terms? I'm here to tell you there is. Patrick Donahoe here from Paradigm Life. I'm an Investopedia top 100 most influential financial advisor, and I recently wrote a best-selling book about the financial strategy that changed my entire investment model and the one that could change yours. To get a copy of my book for free and learn how you can maximize your real estate portfolio by acting as your own bank, send an email to mybank at realestateguysradio.com. Don't make another real estate deal without reading my book first. Email mybank at realestateguysradio.com now to get your copy for free. Hear ye, hear ye. Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 19th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year, our sales legend, Tom Hopkins, the editor of the Gold Newsletter, Brian London, international real estate developer, Beth Clifford, and Jim Rohn's 18-year business partner, Kyle Wilson. And joining us live and in person for his ninth Investor Summit, Peter Schiff. Plus, returning for his ninth Investor Summit, best-selling author, and the Rich Dad Advisor for Real Estate, Ken McElroy. Plus, lots more to be announced. It all begins June 11th in beautiful Belize. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Peter Schiff, Ken McElroy, and an all-star faculty on the 19th Annual Investor Summit. Hi, this is Anthony Mocure from Tell Them Possible, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program, heard every week on this fabulous radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com and your finer podcast outlets. It's Ask the Guys. Your questions are answers. If you have a question for The Real Estate Guys, all you have to do is go to our website at realestateguysradio.com and click the button that says Ask the Guys. This one comes from Cecilia in Denton, Texas. Hi, guys. I can honestly say your podcast is one of the main reasons that helped me build enough confidence to start my real estate investing journey. I have one rental property and I'm currently looking for my second. Good job. As I grow my portfolio, I really want to be sure that I'm not maximizing my margins at the expense of socially and environmental responsibility. I've had a very hard time finding other real estate investors talking about this. 
I know there have got to be investors and organizations thinking about how to solve social problems related to affordable housing and climate change, but unfortunately, I haven't found them yet. Real estate investors are a smart, driven group, and I think we can grow as a community to expand our mindset beyond individual financial freedom and profits to have a greater impact on the communities we live in. If you know of any investors that are passionate about this topic, I would love to learn about them. I really appreciate you guys. Thanks, Cecilia. Well, here's the brilliant part about real estate, Cecilia. You get to decide exactly how you want to build a portfolio. And many of us invest not just for ROI. I'll tell you what, it's hard to get up day after day if you're just about the buck. Instead, we invest based on our passion, our purposes, the markets we care about, and so forth. And there are a lot of people that think this way. The challenge is always finding like-minded individuals and then making that trade-off. We've been involved with a lot of real estate endeavors where the primary focus was what you're talking about, some sort of social capitalism, a reason to invest. Kenny McElroy tells us that the greatest real estate syndications have an awesome story. That doesn't mean every story is about the things you're concerned with, but real estate in general, people will follow you, people will invest, people will put passive money into causes they believe in. So uh, you're, you're on a great track. You've just got to figure out who believes what you believe and how do you create investments around those beliefs. Yeah. And Cecilia, I think I think you're right. Not as many people as you might care for are talking about these things because at the end of the day, investors are focused on the money that's necessary because of the cost of capital and return on investment to investors. With that said, syndication, which is my favorite way of doing this business, is aggregating people who want their money to do something uh, in particular. And it can be around both a social cause and a financial return. I had a chance to be a treasurer of a nonprofit organization in Santa Clara County many years ago, and I ended up becoming uh, a member of the board and I became the treasurer. And when I would look at the numbers, I could see that these people were spending a ton of money on their rent and they were trying to cover their expansion by asking people for donations, $50 at a time. And I said, you know, these people have hundreds of thousands of dollars in their retirement accounts that aren't working and we're paying all this money out for rent. Why don't we ask these people to buy us a building, which would be a good investment for them. And then that would allow us to take the donation money and recycle it back to people who actually support the cause that we believe in. And uh, as it turned out, we put all that together. It was one of my very first syndications. And the guy that we bought the building from carried back and he actually forgave the $250,000 carry back at one point because he believed in what we were doing. So, you know, you don't have to look for a formal organization. You don't have to look for a group of people. Uh, belong to clubs or organizations or movements that are about what you're about and then look around for where real estate is involved because it almost always will be. And then find a way, if you can, to either put forth an idea or some type of a structure so that the group can put their money where their mission is and make it not a donation, but an investment. That worked for me. I think it's one of the funnest stories I have in my real estate career to tell. Uh, and it ended up working really well for the organization as well as the investors. Real estate can absolutely accomplish the kinds of things you're talking about. A uh, great resource is a book written by some friends of ours. It's called The Social Capitalist, Passion and Profits, an Entrepreneurial Journey. Uh, written by uh, Josh and Lisa Lannon, they're Rich Dad Advisors, and they talk about this very thing. And they've been involved with a couple of different social capitalist real estate endeavors with two different things they're passionate about. So it's a wide variety out there. I think that if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, I don't care about that. I just want to make money. Okay, I get that. But if you are thinking, wow, is there a way to have a heart and make return and do some good in the world? Absolutely positively there is. Love the question. Thanks, Cecilia. Our next question comes from Carolyn in Jamaica Plains, Massachusetts. Another one from Massachusetts. Uh, I'm looking to better understand the types of tools real estate investors at all levels use to evaluate their potential investments and what their experience using these tools is like. Do you have any insight that you'd be willing to share? Well, I will tell you, we talk to a lot of investors. We have been investors ourselves for the a longest time. There's no one single answer here, but there's a couple of different categories. To me, I look at the first part of it being analyzing a market 
and a sub market to choose, right? So I'm, I'm first looking at the big pictures of finding out of all the places I could invest, what make the most sense economically and for me. And then the second part of analysis, of course, has to do with the property and its performance. And there's only a ton of those kinds of tools. So I've got some thoughts, but I'm guessing our financial strategist also does. Yeah, analyzing the financial performance of a property isn't really rocket science. At the end of the day, uh, fairly simple formulas. If you can get a vintage copy of Equity Happens, we've got them in there, but they're all over. It's pretty simple. You know, things like cap rate and figuring out your before and after tax cash flow, uh, matter of having good inputs and you should be looking at all those things as part of your underwriting anyway i'm a fan of really figuring that out on your own because when you do that you begin to really understand each individual line item because those line items mean things in the real world if you just punch numbers in fill in the blanks and some software does it uh you you know, may or may not get the answer. Of course, you can build your own software pretty simply for financial analysis with Excel. And again, it's not a very difficult task. I think Robert's point is well taken because at the end of the day, uh, a property can look good on paper based on its numbers. But if you don't understand the dynamics of the market that it's floating in, things over which you have zero control, by the way, uh, means that you're going to be at the mercy and the whim or uh, you're going to be the beneficiary of what's going on in the market. In other words, either the wind is going to be in your face or it's going to be at your back and really understanding your market. And that's things I'm sure Robert can talk better than me, but things like how many people are moving in, how many people are moving out, jobs, what kind of jobs, where the money, the major primary drivers in the economy, where does that money come from? Is it tech? Is it manufacturing? Is it energy? And understanding what are those niches like? What is the future? What are the prospects of those? So it's kind of like macro, what's going on at the highest level, interest rates and overall economic strength and things like that. And down at the local level, some of these other factors like migration and what's going on at the local level. And then you drill down to the property and the sub niche, the neighborhood, what's happening there. And that's where your property managers are probably the best people to tell you what's happening at the street level, where the demand is and where you're more likely to have a more consistent cash flow experience. Yeah, I'm right with you, Russ. I do think that's probably the most important and less taught and less well known and harder to analyze part of it, frankly. You know, the nature of the question is like, are there tools I can use? Well, as you mentioned, Russ, the, the analysis part is really pretty simple. I have a half a dozen property evaluators and analysis apps on my phone. And frankly, there's not any one that I think is perfect. And there's not any one I would recommend so strongly that I'm going to give its name on the show. Uh, but you can find those. And there's literally hundreds of them. Making sure it fits with who you are as an investor is what's critical. But the market part, boy, you better get that right. If you pick the wrong market, you can analyze till the cows come home and there's nothing you're going to be able to do to fix a poor choice in real estate markets. Not every market is created equal. There's a lot of places it makes no sense, in my opinion, to invest in in this big, beautiful world of ours. But there are other places. So tools, yes, but tools are not a substitute. It's like, hey, that contractor has a lot of great tools. That's not why you hire a contractor. You hire them for their wisdom, their experience, their past record of success, and the referrals from people that say, hey, this guy's great. They say he's great or she's great because of the work they have done, because of their book of business, not because of the tools they have in their tool belt. Well, I mean, when we talk about tools, I mean, I, you know, maybe because I'm a financial guy, I just think right away of some spreadsheet where you put in the numbers in and it gives you kind of what the cap rate or whatever is. Uh, and again, I think that math is pretty simple. I think the kind of tools that I think are more valuable are information sources. You know, like we like to go to the Chamber of Commerce and kind of get the thumb on the pulse, read the local business journals and find out what is going on in the local trade press. Uh, if there's a specific industry or a big driver, like in Memphis, it's FedEx, right? You know, take a look at FedEx financials and their annual report and what they're projecting for their business growth and how do they fit in? What are analysts saying about that major employer or major sector? If you're investing in Silicon Valley, obviously it's tech. Then you have to look at things like supply and demand and you, you know, 
try and get some insight into into that. Uh, you know, the, the whether it's U-Haul or BLS, you know, Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics. There's 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 sources of information that you you can aggregate. It's not really the nature of your question, but that's probably where you want to do your homework. Uh, and sometimes that varies. I mean, there's stuff that's available at the national level, but a lot of the best intel is really at the street level. You know, local real estate agents, depending on the product niche you're in, are often gathering and uh, aggregating information and putting together reports as part of their marketing. And that can be pretty good intel. Uh, and the same thing in the property management space. And, you know, you can look at what's going on in the local uh, political scene because that gives you a little bit of uh, direction. And, you know, right now you've got a lot of municipalities that are hungry for cash because their their revenue is down for all the reasons you'd expect in a COVID-19 world. And so, you know, you can look at what the chatter is, what the proposals are and get a feel for, is this going to be a more landlord friendly state or less? Is Are we going to see more property taxes, more pressure, more eviction moratoriums that pre prevent you from being able to get people out of your property when they're not paying? It's a very different world when it comes to due diligence. And I don't know that there's any prepackaged tools that are going to help you quickly be able to accurately assess the things that really matter uh, when you're doing your due diligence. You asked for our insight and there it is. Don't get misled by a bunch of spreadsheets. You got to have that information. And I would say, Russ, your idea of putting that together yourself makes it so much more understandable and real and tangible for you. If you have no clue about spreadsheets, you can certainly start with one of these apps or programs. Many of them are inexpensive or allow you to do a 30-day trial at no cost. Try it on, see if it works. But at the end of the day, having something that you use that drives you in the direction you need to be is critical. It's Ask the Guys, your questions, our answers. When we come back, we're gonna ask you a question as we play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. In uncertain times like this, it's great to know there are two things you can always count on. High demand for affordable single-family homes to live in and Terry Kerr's amazing Memphis team at Mid-South Home Buyers to find, fix, and manage the next addition to your recession-resistant real estate portfolio. The Memphis market is logistics and distribution dynamo with an economic engine that's essential to moving goods and critical supplies all over the United States. Quality rehab, proven profitable property management, affordable rents, and solid ROI make turnkey property investing through Terry's team a dream when it matters most. To learn more about Memphis and Mid-South Home Buyers, send an email to midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. When the world changes, investing strategy changes too. The coronavirus is disrupting economies, financial systems, and daily life like nothing in modern history. Sheltering in place might protect you from the virus, but a wait and see approach to investing now is like pulling the sheets over your head while the house burns down. It's not the time to be complacent. So we're calling our huge network of thought leaders, seasoned investors, and technical experts to find out what they're seeing, thinking, and doing to mitigate risk and capture opportunity, and we're recording all of it. We're calling it our Coronavirus Crisis Investing Webinar, and it's totally Totally free. All you need to do is register. Remember, mainstream media doesn't talk to real estate investors. They don't understand you because Wall Street pays them not to. That's why the real estate guys are here. To register for the Crisis Investing Webinar, simply send an email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com. That's crisis at realestateguysradio.com. Real world wisdom is the best vaccine for a healthy financial future. Send your email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, best-selling author of Tax-Free Wealth, and you're listening to Real Estate Guys Radio. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys Radio program. We're so glad you've tuned in today. Tell a friend about the Real Estate Guys and come on out to the Secrets of Successful Syndication. It happens in Dallas, Texas, the end of March. You can get all the details by sending an email to syndication at realestateguysradio.com. It's our Ask the Guys show. Your questions are answers. Before we get back into the mailbag, it's time for us to ask you a question as we play Real Estate Trivia. Every week we ask a trivia question that has something to do with real estate and we give away a prize. As soon as you hear the question and think you might know the answer, just fire off your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. We'll leave your name, the answer to the question, 
and your physical mailing address because the first person that gets it right is going to get an awesome book called Purpose, Passion, and Profit. It's a collection of awe-inspiring stories from a bunch of cool folks, some you've heard of and many you haven't. That book can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week, we talked about your new plan for the new year when it comes to real estate investing, and we asked this, in which U.S. state is it illegal to slurp your soup? Yeah, that's actually a law, and the answer is the state of New Jersey. In New Jersey, if you slurp your soup, you're breaking the law. One of many crazy laws still on the books. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. In one of its many renovations from 1949 to 1952, the White House was completely gutted and rebuilt with one major construction update. What was it? Yeah, what was the big change that happened in the White House when it was renovated back in the early 50s? Do you know or just want to guess? It's a real estate trivia question. Send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your guess, your name, and your physical mailing address. And the first person that gets it correct is going to get this awesome book put together by our friend Kyle Wilson. It's called Purpose, Passion, and Profit. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's Ask the Guys. Your questions are answers. If you have a question for the Real Estate Guys, when you go to our website at realestateguysradio.com, you'll see a little button that says Ask the Guys. You can fill that form out and it comes to us like magic. This question comes from Daniel in Spokane Valley, Washington. Hey guys, my friend said he went to your event on real estate syndication. My company recently got into apartment acquisitions and the two deals we've done, we've had to assign. We want to be able to close on these deals, but another problem is we need sponsors as well as investors. Which events of yours would you recommend I go to? All right, Daniel. Well, our shameless uh, self-promotion of our events would say uh, every every event. Um, but the Secrets of Successful Syndication is a two-day workshop we do twice a year that's designed for two groups of people. Folks that are ready to go full-time into real estate investing, maybe have a great uh, experience or portfolio of properties and want to do more and are only limited by capital and want to raise money and become syndicators. And the other group are people that want to passively invest and really learn what it takes to vet these kinds of deals. So that event happens at the end of March, depending on when you're listening, uh, but you can always find out the details uh, at our website, realestateguysradio.com under events. Being able to close is critical and you can make money by wholesaling or assigning. Sounds like you guys are focusing on apartments. You found a couple of great deals. So you've got that skill set. Now, the next step is to be able to know with certainty that you can raise the capital necessary from a variety of sources, by the way, uh, in the time allowed. Most sellers today want to see you close in a reasonable time frame. And most new syndicators take a long time to raise capital the first time around. So we'll help you through navigating some of that kind of stuff. And, and that's probably not only is it the next event on our calendar, probably is the next one you'd want to uh, attend. I'm also going to strongly recommend an awesome uh, class we only do uh, once a year called How to Win Funds and Influence People. It's Russ's two-day sales training, and it's designed specifically to give you the skills which you will uh, drill for, a lot of role-playing. Uh, it's a lot of fun, but you'll learn a ton. Uh, and the how to sit across the table from somebody and raise capital. It's not a skill most people are born with, but it is absolutely learnable. Yeah, I think it really just comes down to uh, understanding that you are in business to solve other people's problems. When we go to raise money, we often think about how they can help us, but that's the wrong approach. When you go to the marketplace, it's how can you help other people? The good news is you've picked a niche that is really popular. People are aware of it. They understand it. There's a lot of money flooding into it for all the right reasons. The bad news is you picked a really hot niche which means that it's super competitive to acquire properties and it's super competitive to attract capital because there's a lot of deals going on all the time. So assuming that you're finding really good deals in really good markets uh, and they're competitive, at least on paper, the thing that's going to make the difference is your brand, how well people know you and how well they trust you in terms of your ethics and your capability and your network. How many people do you know? And putting yourself in as many environments as you can where you're going to meet the right kind of people and able to show up looking the right way and get into the right kind of conversations. And if you lead with solutions that you have deals that people who have capital that they want to put to work, 
uh, then that's great. Now, you said you also have a need of sponsors, so it sounds like you may need people with balance sheets or credit scores or perhaps some level of expertise. But again, it always goes back to the same thing. Figure out what you have to offer. Maybe it's just your hustle. You're in the deal flow, and that that takes some time to do, to build relationships with people in a market and, and be on the short list of people that see a deal first, not last. Uh, develop that, and that's worth something to both sponsors and investors. But look at what you have to work with. You've already identified what it is you need, and then look at how you can trade what you have to get what you need to get where you both want to go together. And if you approach it that way, uh, you're you're going to be fine. Great question, Daniel. We'll look forward to meeting you at the Secrets of Successful Syndications. And I think this next person as well, this comes from JT in Boulder, Colorado. He says, hey guys, longtime fan and regular listener of your great podcast, and I'm looking forward to joining an upcoming Secrets of Successful Syndication event. He's got a really interesting question. He says, if you were working a number of years to learn the ropes with the goal of growing your own wings, when would you say is the right time to fly the nest? What important touchstones would guide you in knowing when it's time? I'm an architect and former contractor with a passion for design, build, develop with a niche of boutique and uniquely positioned projects. And as you know, there's a lifetime worth of knowledge, but if we always focus on B, there is no do and will result in no have. Thank you for all you do. I look forward to meeting you both at an upcoming event. All right. Well, JT, I'll tell you what, for a lot of folks, they, as we talked about earlier, get up and go to work on some nine to five. And then on the side, they invest in real estate. We're big fans of kind of combining those things. How can you get paid to live a life you love? And if you love real estate, there are some ways to go full time. In this case, if you're talking about, you know, branching out from working for somebody into your own space, your own company, whether that's hiring people, whether you're a one man band, there's a lot to think about there. To me, I think the, the question is, is when are you ready? When you have the right support network, right? You are never going to know everything you need to know. You're never going to be confident when you're just starting out. Your confidence can't be in yourself. Your confidence has to be in your access to people who are competent. And if you have built that, if you focus your attention on building that, whether it's in a mentoring program or whether you build a great board of advisors or you create your own mastermind, however you do it, or a combination of all those things, uh, the first thing to do is just identify who you need to have on your team, if you will, even though they're not on your payroll, who do you have to have access to who knows how to do every aspect of the business? And when you have that, then you go out there and you get yourself into a deal. You're going to be in over your head by definition, but you're just a lifeline phone call away from getting the help you need. So again, to answer the question, when you have that group of people built or largely built so that through them, anything you're missing, you can find quickly, then you're ready to go. I'd also recommend uh, reading Before You Quit Your Job by Robert Kiyosaki, one of his lesser known, but one of my favorite books of his. And, and the mindset of not appreciating everything that your existing company does for you, just think through all that, right? You have an office to go to and the lights and the heat are on and they've got signage and perhaps a book of business. If you're responsible for bringing in clients, Make sure you got that figured out. It's going to take some time to get up to speed. Make sure you have budget for that. And ultimately, when you design what you would love to do, whether you got paid or not, you're going to love your life. So big, big fans of helping to encourage you out of the nest, just not so early that you fall flat on your face. It's Ask the Guys, your questions, our answers, lots more on the way. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Are you an accredited investor looking for reliable cash flow with some additional upside? You probably realize that energy drives all economic activity. The COVID-19 global slowdown created a temporary crash in oil prices, which in turn opened up a tremendous but little known opportunity. This unique situation has allowed a seasoned team of oil professionals to craft a compelling structure that locks in profit when oil prices are low, while capturing significant upside when prices increase. And this offering leverages proven oil production, not risky exploration. Sound intriguing? Then your first investment should be the 20 minutes it takes to watch a short video that will detail this high yield passive income opportunity. Simply send your email request to blueridge at realestateguysradio.com 
If you're an accredited investor looking for predictable yield with sizable upside, email Blue Ridge at realestateguysradio.com. That's Blue Ridge at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hi, I'm Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Listen up. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. It's Ask the Guys. Your questions are answers. If you want to hang out with the guys, then come to where we'll be. We've got our own events, but we also speak at other people's events. We attend conferences. Most of those you can find on our website at realestateguysradio.com under events. Our next question comes from Rick in Huntington Beach, California. He says, hey, guys, I've listened to Schiff, Dent, Rogers, Rickards, and the real estate guys regarding the coming collapse of the dollar in the U.S. economy. I understand we should be investing in gold, silver, gold stocks, and assets outside of the U.S. As a single-family rental real estate investor, I have yet to hear how we should position our real estate portfolios for the coming crisis. If you could provide some insight on this topic, it would be much appreciated. Thank you, Rick. All right, Rick. Well, first of all, you know, the, the coming collapse of the dollar in the U.S. economy, what an uplifting topic that is. But I think we're just paying attention, and the guys you mentioned are paying attention. The dollar's value over time is extremely clear. There's no doubt about it. There's no difference of opinion. There's no skewing the facts. The reality is the U.S. dollar continues to be worth less and less and less. And that's just a trend. So we just have to recognize that. And so what do you do about that? Uh, we're not going to get into, you know, gold and all that kind of stuff on this program. If you've never invested in metal and you want to know why the real estate guys like precious metals, uh, Russ and our friend Dana Samuelson have put together an excellent series. It's the silver series. And it really talks about silver, but you'll get the bigger picture. It's multiple episodes on our YouTube channel. It's totally free. Just send an email to silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. You'll dig it. Dana is amazing. He's an actual physical metals dealer. He knows a ton about it. But I will tell you, real estate guy Russell Gray has also got his head firmly around this space. But let's address the question that you've talked about. If there were going to be an economic collapse, if the dollar continues its trend, what do you do as a single family real estate investor? Well, the first thing, is exactly what you're doing. Real estate is a way to short the dollar. Yeah, so debt uh, is a way to borrow dollars when they're valuable and buy something valuable, especially stream of income and tax breaks. And then as the dollar falls in value, it takes more of them to buy the same real asset like real estate. And that's how equity happens. And we've been talking about that for a long, long, long time. Uh, the danger is, of course, when you use debt that you are impacted by cash flows. And if employment falls, if wages fall, if there's a lot of real economic stress, or Jim Rickard's new book that uh, I just started reading called The New Great Depression, uh, talks about some of that type of pressure. Now, the flip side of that is, is that the uh, powers that be are very well aware of that pressure. And I think they have a lot of motivation to protect the banks and the bond markets. And they will print as many dollars as it take and uh, shovel them directly into people's bank accounts uh, in order for them to be able to make their payments. But that doesn't mean that some landlords won't bleed out, right? You get an eviction moratorium and, and that takes the pressure off the tenant's balance sheet because there's nothing there. And it puts it on the landlord's balance sheet. And you're going to have to drain down your savings or go into debt to try to wait that thing out. So uh, you do have to be very, very careful. Right now in today's market, I'm a big fan of getting your equity out, locking in long-term cheap money because that's what's available in the in the residential space right now. And I get as much of that as you can get. But 
I don't know that I would necessarily take that and put it all right back into real estate, especially highly leveraged real estate. Did that game once in 2008, didn't end well. A bigger fan of maybe taking some of those proceeds and putting it into precious metals or leaving it in cash and waiting for whatever's going to happen to happen and then stepping back in. If you have some of it in metal, you're insulated from the dollar falling. And we're doing a whole series on that. I'm just in the middle of videotaping all of that. So it, it should be done soon. But if you're interested in it, it's precious equity at realestateguysradio.com. The one thing I do want to say is this. You said that, you know, Schiff, Dent, Rogers, Rickards, and us are all talking about the coming collapse of the dollar in the U.S. economy. I want to kind of correct that or go on record. Uh, the dollar may collapse. I don't know that it's going to happen soon because it's still going to be one of the stronger currencies in the basket in the world, but it's pretty clear that the globalists want a global reset. I mean, they're open about it. Davos, the World Economic Forum, uh, they're talking about it. And if the dollar ends up failing under the pressure it's being put on to save the whole world from this COVID-19 lockdown, then there's going to be a reset. And that reset may mean we end up using a different currency or whatever, and all that's fine. But, but the thing, that, what an economy is, is people getting up having needs and then people working to meet those needs and trading. That is not going to stop. That is never going to stop. That's why you want to have things you can barter with. We, we did a couple of summits at sea where we, the whole thing was just about bartering and learning how to be an effective barterer. Uh, it's about having some inventory to get over whatever the hump is until the powers that be institute whatever the new currency or medium of exchange is going to be. And then the other thing is having some ballast just in case you run into a real tough spot and you know you have to make mortgage payments and you don't have income or you have inadequate income. And then the other thing is just paying close attention, which you're already doing, so that when the tide starts to turn, you can begin to make strategic moves. We stay very plugged in. We usually find out about things a little bit ahead of the crowd um, and we try to bring them to you as quickly as we can along with the people we heard them from so you can get it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, and then we come up with strategies that we hope will, will work based on what's happening. Of course, no one can predict the future, but there will be a country, there will be people, there will be an economy, there will be opportunity. We just have to stay nimble and aware right now. And specifically when it comes to real estate, we like recession resistant price points. So people always need to live under a roof. And what you have to quote unquote barter with is housing. And when you have a great portfolio of housing, that can go a long way. And it is one of the basic human needs. So we love residential real estate for that reason, but also be prudent knowing with uh, the eviction moratoriums and those kinds of things, outer forces may prevent you from collecting your rent. So make sure you have a plan B for that. But we're not plans of just selling everything and going into the metals. That's not the plan at all. Real estate is our primary investment vehicle. Always has been, always will be. We do the other things to help kind of strengthen our overall position come what may. Well, thanks for all your great questions. Wish we had time to answer more. We'll do this again. If you have a question for the Real Estate Guys, just go to the website of realestateguysradio.com and click Ask the Guys. We've got a great predictions panel in the works. Coming up, you're going to hear from a lot of smart people about where they see the puck going in 2021. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.